Hi, I am Ronald the Rules Lawyer, and I'm going to run five fifth level monks through a combat demonstration in this video. This is part two of my three part series, D&D Monks But Good. Monks are considered the weakest class in D&D 5th edition, and we want to see how they work in Pathfinder, where I think they're awesome, which I think can inform the design process for its next edition, and also show more people Pathfinder. In part one, we did an overview of the monk's features, and we built five very different monks, and now in this combat, we're going to see them in action. I already did a combat demonstration with five first-level human fighters. There'll be a link to the description, but I had those restrictions for that fight to make a point then of what you can do with even those limitations. We don't need to make that point anymore, and so we're going to go up to fifth level with our monks. At fifth level, martial characters, which monks are, are expected to have a couple of fundamental runes on their hand wraps uh, that give them more accuracy and an extra die of damage. So they're going to have those. And this is also going to be an extreme threat encounter. Pathfinder's encounter system is reliable, and an extreme threat encounter is about as strong collectively as the party is collectively. It should rarely be used by game masters, but it makes for a good demonstration of the monks and all of their abilities. For a four-person party, that means 160 XP of creatures, but because we have five PCs, that will be 200 XP. The XP values of the monsters depend on their relative level to the party's level. We just add monsters up that add up to 200 XP. We'll start from the highest level creatures first. First is a level 7 spellcaster called a demonologist. It is worth 80 XP because it's two levels higher than the party. It is good at summoning powerful creatures. Next is a zombie hulk. It is a huge zombie creature. It's going to be three by three squares on the battle map. And it's normally a level 6 creature, so normally would be worth 60 XP. I gave it the weak template, so that is one level lower, and is 40 XP. Next is the Ghost Commoner, a level 4 creature that is worth 30 XP. Next is the Caligni Slayer, which is level 3 and worth 20 XP. It was called Darkstalker in previous editions. Then two level 2 Skeletal Champions that collectively are worth 30 XP. Here we are. You'll recognize the same arena from the level 1 fighter demonstration. This time our heroes, however, are voluntarily entering this fight as part of a tournament. And here are their foes. The ghost is hiding over here to the west, inside a wall. Our five builds are Duncan, our drunken master, who also misdirects foes and uses athletics maneuvers to stymie them. Kane, our crane monk, who has a good defense and has a shield and has high maneuverability, is able to leap around the battlefield. Then we have P, who is our Leshy, our sentient plant ancestry, uh, who is able to fire her seeds and is focused on key abilities. Helen is our weapon monk. She's a dwarf and also has a bow staff, which has a reach, which she can do monk things with. And Harper is our Zen Archer. She has a stance that lets her do monk abilities with her bow. As the battle begins, I'll note that there's many corpses in the battlefield for the zombie hulk to work with. So the bell rings and there's a deafening roar from the crowd and all of our combatants roll initiative. First in initiative is Duncan, our drunken master. Actually, many of the party members are first in initiative. Because of his fast speed, he can move up here and leap over the central pit 15 feet as an action. However, running up to a big brute like this, using all of his actions to do so, doesn't make much sense. In fact, the party confers and figures better to delay now and see if some of the enemies will get closer. Harper, our monastic archer, is going to spend her first action to recall knowledge about this zombie hulk to find out some of its special abilities and maybe weaknesses. With her plus 10, she succeeds and finds out it has the ability to hit two creatures within its reach with one action, so better not to clump up around it. Also, they know from past experience that zombies probably are weak to slashing damage. She conveys that to the party and she now enters her monastic archer stance. This lets her do flurry of blows with her bow and also do additional special monk abilities so long as she's within the first half of the range increment. In her case, because she has a composite short bow, she has to be within 30 feet of an enemy. But with her third action, she is gonna do flurry of blows with her bow. She makes two strikes with her bow. Her first arrow hits, and her second one with a minus five accuracy penalty misses. She does have the stunning fist ability, which might stun the zombie. However, she's not within 30 feet of it. With her hit, she's going to deal 
four damage, four piercing damage. This will be a theme. Uh, ranged attacks don't do as much damage as melee attacks. Even with a composite short bow, propulsive weapons only add one half of her strength bonus to the damage, rounding down. Also delaying will be Kane, and our boss, Demon Summoner, the Demonologist, is also going to delay for some reason. So is P. She's going to delay to hopefully these monsters will get closer. And to their surprise, from the west comes the Ghost Commoner. This ghost can fly, and she's also incorporeal, so she cannot be grappled. And we're going to see her resistance to damage in a second. But she's going to fly towards the party and try to get... Beyond their reach, she goes to a 15-foot altitude, and she makes a frightful moan with her last two actions. Every living creature within 30 feet must make a will-saving throw to avoid becoming frightened. Frightened is a bad debuff. It puts a penalty on all of your stats, all of your defenses, including your AC, all of your attacks, and four of them fail their saving throws. P is the only one not frightened, but the others will all become frightened too. That turned out pretty bad. Next is the zombie hulk. It permanently has the slowed one condition. That means it can only do two actions per turn. Many zombies have this permanent condition. So it uses one action just to lumber forward. It's holding two corpses, one in each hand. And with <laughs> one corpse, it's going to hurl it it's going to aim for Helen, and this corpse is going to have a plus 15 bonus, and that 30 hits. Just one short of a crit. Her AC, because of her frightened condition, got lowered from 23. Double tap, double tap. This is the most unreliable Windows feature. 21. If it had been 31, it would have crit. But anyway, it still does a lot of damage, however, and it does 16 bludgeoning damage to Helen. P, our Leshy Monk, wants to re-enter initiative. She is our key monk. She took feats that give her key spells. She has a focus pool of two focus points, and each spell costs her one point. Because she's a Leshy, she took the Seed Pod feat, which lets her do unarmed range strikes with seeds that she fires. She's going to aim at that ghost. Because it's an unarmed attack, she can use her Flurry of Blows against it, so it's a Flurry of Seeds. She makes two attacks with her Seeds, and because it has a 10-foot range increment, she gets minus two because it's beyond the first range increment. If that's a hit, and her second attack also hits. Because it is a Flurry of Blows, she's going to add the damage from both strikes together before applying resistances. That's important against this ghost. She does a four and four damage. Her range attacks do not add any number to the dice. The ghost has resistance to all damage, resistance 5 to all damage, so this 8 is reduced to 3. Notice it's a range increment, so she can fire much farther than 10 feet away, up to 60 feet in fact, but her strikes would have a minus 10 penalty. Notice that she flurried without having to spend any key. She can do this every turn. The next thing she does is she has her battle medicine feet. She's going to use her healer's tools and try to heal Helen right now. She needs only a 15 on this medicine check to succeed. And with that 31, she will critically succeed and heal 4d8 health to Helen. And Helen is now back to full. With P's third action, she is going to run up these stairs, and which are difficult terrain to her. But with her 35 foot speed, she can make it all the way here. I wonder what she's gonna do. Why is she leaving the enemies? Next, the demonologist re-enters initiative. After having assessed the battlefield, he's going to use his big ability. He is a 7th level creature, and he normally can only cast 4th level, or now they're going to be renamed 4th rank spells after the Pathfinder Remaster comes out this fall. But he is a demonologist. He can cast 5th level Summon Fiend and bring in a Barbazu, a bearded devil, onto the battlefield. To do this, he needs to sacrifice 2 prepared 4th level spells, and he does so. And he's going to take 4d12 mental damage. And in this case, it is going to be 27. Harper, meanwhile, has a reaction to try to recognize this spell. This is a divine spell because it's summoning a fiend. And her religion skill is trained only, so she can automatically recognize a spell of a rank 2 or lower. Her secret check succeeds, and she recognizes it. However, not critically succeeds. And the GM will probably tell her also of this demonologist special ability, even when he's knocked out there's a chance every turn that the summon still keeps acting. It's a three-action spell, this many summoning spells are. 
And this Barbazu will take form right here, could be up to 30 feet away. Summoned creatures have the minion trait. They can only take two actions per turn. Right now, when it summons it, it makes the two actions right now to threaten this archer on the other side. And in future turns, the demonologist can spend one action to sustain this summon, which gives the Barbazu two more actions. If he fails to sustain it, Bar the Barbazu disappears. Barbazus also have this nasty reaction called Attack of Opportunity, which triggers even when a ranged attack happens within their reach. And they have a reach weapon. Fortunately for Harper, minions don't have reactions, so she won't have to worry about that. So that took all of the demonologist actions. Next is R, the skeletal champions. They're going to spend their first two actions to stride forward and go right there and also raise their shields. Shields require an action to raise, and it adds two to their armor class. Their armor class is now going to be 21. The party decides now they want to focus on this ghost. Kane will enter the initiative. He is our crane monk. The crane's stance, which he's about to enter, gives him more defense and allows him to jump farther. So he will do that as his first action. Stances are a way to get into different fighting styles as a monk in Pathfinder 2. You can even have more than one fighting stance that you take from class feats and change stances in the middle of battle. But when you enter a stance, you cannot enter another stance for another round. Also, you cannot enter a stance until an encounter starts. As part of his high defense, he's also wielding a magical shield. But he's not going to raise it. Instead, he's going to attack the ghost. Now, how will he do that if the ghost is 15 feet up and he has no seed pods? But he has the flying kick feet. He's going to spend two actions to leap up and make a strike and be able to land safely. Now, normally you can only leap up three feet. However, Kane is in crane stance, so that adds two feet. He also has the skill feat Powerful Leap, which adds two feet. He also has Dancing Leaf, a amazing monk feat, which adds five feet. So he can jump 12 feet up into the air and make this attack. So it leaps up Matrix style into the air and makes this strike at the ghost. And here we go. That is a 19, which misses by one. His attack bonus was lowered by two because he was frightened. Oh well, he lands safely to the ground. Entering his stance and flying kick took all of his actions. Now that his turn ends, his frightened value goes down by one. So as you can see, frightened is a moderate debuff that goes away on its own and it doesn't shut him down completely. Next, Duncan gets out of initiative and wants to go next. He's our drunken master. He could enter his stance right now, but that's going to take an action. He wants to do something else because he has the Bama skill feat and he says something to try to distract it. Something like, oh, still trying to fight a match to leave the gladiator arena? I don't know. I'm not that good at jokes. And he rolls his diplomacy skill against the ghost with that minus two penalty from being frightened. 18 succeeds against the ghost. So it will have a minus two penalty to its perception and its will saving throw for a minute. It will have to try to insult him back, say something back in order to end the effect. He spent his first action doing that in order to ready a flurry of blows. Ready in Pathfinder, you have to spend two actions to prepare a single action that has a trigger. This lets you interrupt another creature's turn, unlike delay. And he gets to keep his current spot in the initiative order. Once the ghost flies down to him and he can reach it, he's going to do a flurry of blows. His frightened goes down, and next we go to Helen. She is our bow staff fighter, which has a reach. She can reach any square within two squares of her. And the party thinks she should head off these skeletal champions that are coming down. So she's going to do that. Because she is a dwarf, she has a speed penalty, but she is a monk. So she can uh, run 30 feet here, no problem. With her reach weapon, she is going to do a flurry of blows against a skeletal champion. Because she has the monastic weaponry class feat, she gets to do monk abilities with monk weapons. So action number two is to make two attacks. And one of them hits. This next one missed by four because of the combination of the shield and her being frightened too. Part of why she was assigned to these skeletons is because they know that skeletons, that bludgeoning damage is good against skeletons. So she's going to make this hit and do 11 damage to the skeletal champion. Skeletal champions have the shield block reaction also. 
they get to soak damage with their shield. So the shield is going to reduce that incoming damage by five and do six damage to the skeletal champion and six damage to the shield. And with her third action, remember she just moved forward and then made two strikes. She's going to move right here. So you have this really effective spring attack ability as a monk. You can move in, make a flurry of blows, move away. And also, most creatures don't have attack of opportunity. These skeletal champions happen to have attack of opportunity, but her reach weapon allowed her to attack it without getting within its reach. Finally, because she is a courageous dwarf with dwarven doubtiness, her frightened value goes down by two instead of one. She's no longer frightened at all. Next is our Kaligni Slayer. Um, he is a lurker and is just going to try to move twice here and use his third action to try to hide behind this pillar. So this is our situation after the first round. The enemies have gotten closer. Helen was able to do her spring attack. This ghost came out and now they're trying to focus fire on this ghost, try to eliminate this threat first. Next is Harper, our archer. She wants to attack this ghost commoner with her short bow. She's going to do flurry of blows. But making those two attacks will only cost her one of her actions. So she wants to set up this attack. She's going to create a diversion. It's something any character can do with the deception skill. She's going to say, hey, look, behind you. Try to distract its attention and maybe make it turn around. So she's going to do a deception skill check. And that 18 succeeds because um, Duncan had insulted it, uh, lowering its perception by two. So it, now it is flat-footed. In addition to everything else, its AC goes down from 20 to 18. And now she's going to do her flurry of blows. Hopefully she can combine damage. That hits precisely because it's flat-footed. She is now going to roll damage. And six damage is going to get reduced to one. Um, again, not much. But by doing damage, she can trigger her stunning fist. The ghost is not flat-footed to this second attack. And that misses. However, she did hit it with her flurry, and she doesn't have to spend any key to do this. The target must do a fortitude saving throw, and she's able to do it with her bow because of monastic archer stance, and it's within 30 feet, and is going to fail. The DC would be Harper's class DC, which normally is 21, but because she's frightened, it's lowered to 19. This class DC is based on her dexterity score. Because the ghost commoner fails, it becomes stunned one. It cannot take reactions, and it has a number attached to it. That's the number of actions it loses on its next turn. If she had critically failed her fortitude saving throw, she would be stunned three right now. Then with her third action, Harper is going to move up these stairs right here um, to stay within 30 feet of the zombie hulk and also get out of this uh, Barbazu's reach. But yeah, that was cool. She's able to try to stun something every single time she flurries. The Ghost Commodore is next, and if she had three actions right now, she'd try to insult Duncan back. Um, but she wants to hit him. She only has two actions, so she's going to fly down. And remember, Duncan had readied a flurry of blows, so it triggers now. Here we go. That is a miss. <laughs> that is a miss, unfortunately. And the Ghost is now going to try to hit him. And that hits because he was frightened a lot of these plus ones have been mattering that's seven negative damage which will probably be called void damage in the remaster next to the zombie hulk who still has one corpse in hand and it's going to throw it at harper as a 30 foot range so this plus 15 is going to hit oh ouch 19 damage she had no reaction by the way um she in theory could have used her deflect arrows ability but she had used a reaction already to try to recognize the spell. And also, arguably, this is too massive a projectile, a full corpse, for her to use deflect arrows against. The zombie only had two actions, so it picks up another corpse. All right, P is a leshy, a leaf leshy. So she can now glide up to 25 feet forward, and she's going to do exactly that right above the ghost. She can keep doing this as long as she spends an action gliding every turn. Seeing her opportunity, she's also going to use her key spell, Key Strike. It gives her a plus one status bonus to her attack rolls in this flurry of blows that's about to happen. It also gives an extra 1d6 damage, and because it's undead, she wants to do positive damage, which will become vitality damage in the remaster. So as you can see, Key Strike is flurry plus in this system. 
She is spending key to do it, but even without spending key, she has the basic Flurry of Blows ability. But here we go. It's a more accurate attack, and she's going to attack with her fists. That is a hit, and that is a miss, unfortunately. But she is going to do this damage and add a d6 of vitality or positive damage. Normally, the Ghost Commoner's resistance would apply against each type of damage. However, positive damage is one thing that she does not resist at all. So this is a total of 7 damage. Now she could glide somewhere else right now, but she wants to keep her altitude, so she's going to stay right here. Kane and Duncan had been asking her to uh, try to look at that zombie hulk and recall something more about it, observe it, let's say. And so she's going to do that, and she's going to succeed. What they had wanted to know was whether it had slow reflexes versus being tough physically. Basically, is its fortitude save higher than its reflex save? And she confirms that, and that's important for characters that want to do battle maneuvers like tripping. So we will see that play out. She now knows that it is pretty slow when it comes to reflexes. So next, the Demonologist is going to sustain his summon spell. So the Barbazu immediately takes two actions. going to move right here. His glaive can hit every one of these squares right now. And he's going to attack that archer again, because it looks the weakest at the moment. So here comes an attack. And that's going to be a hit for 12 damage against Harper. And he has a special ability that lets him reposition her toward himself as part of that. The Demonologist has two actions left, and he is going to... he is ruthless. He is going to cast Fireball. Harper will not try to recognize this spell because she's a little concerned about that sneaky foe, the Kalikni, that went up with a dagger in hand. She wants to save her reaction. It's going to target right here, so it's going to target all these creatures, including some of his own allies. The Barbazu doesn't care because he is immune to fire, and that was a cool animation. So they're now all about to take damage. Here's the damage. 19, not that bad. The Ghost Commoner is going to make a save and succeed. The DC, by the way, is 26. This is a higher level caster, so it's going to be pretty tough here. Uh, that is a success. And because it resists all damage, it's going to resist five of that and take only four damage total. So P makes her saving throw. That fails. So she's going to take 19 damage. Helen is going to succeed and take half damage. Duncan is going to make a reflex saving throw. That fails, so he's going to take 19 damage. Kane will make a saving throw. 19 is also going to fail. Harper is going to make a saving throw. And, ooh, that's going to critically fail. Um, 14 is at least 10 lower than... 26. High level casters are scary. So she's going to spend her hero point. She Every player starts every session with a hero point, one of them, and the most common way to spend hero points is to re-roll a d20 that you just rolled. So she's going to do that and improve it to a regular failure. So she's going to take 19 damage. So she's still on her feet. She has one hit point left. Next are the skeletal champions, and this one's actually going to raise its shield first before approaching. It's a cunning foe. And as it does so, and leaves this particular square, uh, Helen's going to use her standstill reaction. She can strike the skeleton if it leaves, if it does a move action within her reach. So here is a strike. That it, she rolled a 19 on the die, but that's a crit because its AC is 21, and she, that's at least a 10 higher. So this is critical hit damage. And, ooh, 34. Um, well, the Skeletal Champion could try to shield block it, but that would not be enough. Um, it destroys the Skeletal Champion, which only had 19 health left. This other Skeletal Champion is definitely going to raise its shield too and try to go to that same spot and walks past its uh, former ally. And it now tries to strike Helen with a longsword. And that is a hit. Mm, eight slashing damage. Next is Kane. Kane wants to do something about this zombie, and mm, he would like to go up to the zombie and trip it. But this isn't your regular ground. It's a narrow surface. He would have to balance across it as a separate action. 
and that would take two actions. He does not want to end his turn next to this big brute. He considers other things. He can leap, since he has a fast speed, he can leap 15 feet. Um, but he's in crane stance, and crane stance lets you leap five more feet horizontally. But he also has powerful leap, which lets him leap horizontally five more feet. And he has dancing leap, which lets him jump five more feet. So he can actually, from where he's standing right now, do the leap action 30 feet. So he's going to leap up into the air. He could do a flurry of blows right now, but he wants to trip it and maybe make it more vulnerable to his allies' attacks. When you're tripped, by the way, you become flat-footed or off-guard, and even archer arrows uh, become more accurate from a distance. He now knows that it has a lower reflex save. Grappling it is therefore probably a bad idea, because that goes against its fortitude defense. Tripping it goes against its reflexes, so he will do a athletics check against his reflex DC. That is a critical success at 29, so it's going to fall to the ground and also take an extra d6 of damage after it falls prone. It takes four more damage. The next thing he does is he's going to go here. He's going to leap here, of course. Um, he hopes to get at this caster. This devil has been troublesome. Maybe he can make it stop st sustaining it. Next, Duncan is going to enter his stumbling stance. While he's in this stance, he can only do stumbling swing attacks but he misdirects foes. He gets plus one on his checks to try to feint against an enemy. That makes the enemy flat-footed to him or off guard. He also has another ability. Um, if an enemy misses him with a melee attack, they're flat-footed to his next attack. So he's gonna try to misdirect the ghost commoner uh, with a fake blow. And he gets a plus one to this. And remember, uh, she's been insulted, so she has a minus two penalty. Uh, she. Uh, he succeeds, and so that makes her flat-footed to this next attack from his flurry of blows. So here we go. That is a hit. And then with the second attack, that's another hit. The first hit would have been a crit if you weren't still frightened. Uh, but that's two hits. Ooh, high damage roll. Decent damage roll. So that all gets combined because of flurry of blows. Uh, 27 damage. It has 15 health left. It has resistance 5 because uh, it's a ghost. So that is a destroyed ghost. So that took all three of his actions and his frightened condition goes away. Helen is next and she's going to try to hit the skeletal champion. She is not going to flurry though and we'll see why. She tries to strike it. She hits. She's going to hit it for ooh, a good amount of damage. 17. So it is going to shield block that. But that's going to do 12 damage to the shield, and that breaks the shield. The next thing she does is she wants to go here and support her allies. She, um, by moving here, um, she is hoping that the skeletal champion will have to walk up to them to attack them, triggering her standstill ability again. And from here, she's going to attack the Barbazu. Because she didn't do Flurry of Blows, she is uh, not doing that very inaccurate attack here. And that's a hit. Exactly. And she's going to do... 14 damage. However, it's going to resist five of that. It seems to have resistance to her damage somehow. The Kalikin Slayer had tried to hide here, but it did not know that it failed. So it's now going to try to throw a poisoned dagger at Harper. And she uses her Deflect Arrows reaction, which is going to increase her AC from 22 to 26. That actually just caused it to miss and keeps her on her feet. If the Kaligni had successfully hidden, then she wouldn't be able to use this reaction. Frustrated, it runs up to Harper and picks up that dagger. So now we start round three, and Harper is next, and she is in danger. She has only one hit point, so she's going to use her healer's gloves on herself. Um, no check required. She just heals herself 2d6 plus 7. She can do this once per day. That gives her 16 health back. And then she's going to move over here, and she's going to try to do a flurry of blows against that Barbazu. She hopes to stun it and deny it an action, uh, because it needs all of its actions to move here and attack her. So here comes a flurry. That is a hit, and this is a miss. So she's now going to roll damage, and roll 7 damage. It still does damage after its resistance, so it's now going to do a fortitude save. It has to get a 20 to succeed on this saving throw. That 28 succeeds, so it's not stunned, unfortunately, and her frightened value goes down, 
and that glaive caused her to bleed. And it's this nasty ability that bearded devils have. Normally persistent damage, you take it at the end of your turn, and then you roll a d20, a flat check. That means no modifiers, and you have to get a 15 or higher. But this nasty Barbazu has a ability that um, requires a 20 on this check. So here we go. Let's see if she succeeds. She takes a d6 of bleed damage. Okay, only one. And then she needs a 20 on this roll. Okay, nope. So she's still bleeding. Next is the zombie Hulk. It is prone, which um, sucks. It gives it a minus two penalty on attacks. It's going to stand up as its first action. It's still holding a corpse, and it's going to throw it at Kane. That is a miss. Kane was lucky, but that's all it can do. Um, it's nice to trip a slowed creature because they only have one action while standing. So that's its turn. Next is P, who has been gliding in the air. She's going to do a flyby attack uh, on the Barbazu. She's going to fly right above the Barbazu, or right here, actually, and um, make her attack. Now, she could do key strike and try to do cold damage. Maybe that would be useful against it. She only has one key point left, though, so she's going to save that and do her regular flurry of blows. Hit, and second attack hits. So because of its resistance to damage, this was important because of flurry of blows. 9 plus 9, 18, becomes 13 damage to the Barbazu. Um, and she continues <laughs> gliding and alights on the ground right here. The Demonologist is next, and the first thing he does is sustain the spell and the barbazu will now attack helen and hit and do that nasty bleed damage that's going to be actually 10 damage and it will reposition helen right here and with his next action he's going to try to shove her into the pit this is going to be an athletics check but it has the multiple attack penalty it has the attack trait so we're going to subtract five from this plus eight 15 is not going to get her fortitude dc of 20 so that is not a shove and that was a close call next the demonologist wants to neutralize kane uh he's gonna cast a spell he's gonna cast hideous laughter on kane uh he's gonna need to get a 26 on the saving throw and 27 is enough he was lucky there um basically if he had failed then the de he would be slowed one so long as the demonologist sustains a spell as he is caught up in fits of laughter and his success doesn't negate it entirely. He's still affected by it. He's still laughing, and he cannot use reactions. So that'll be true so as long as it's sustained. So we see here the four degrees of success in action, giving four different results to a spell that often shuts down enemies in other games. Next is the Skeletal Champion. It's going to, well, its shield is broken now. So it's going to walk up to Helen, and Helen has um, that standstill ability, so she's going to attack the skeleton <laughs> and critically hit the skeleton. Um, this is probably destroyed now. She has been on fire. Um, yep, 24 damage destroys the skeleton. That ends that. Next is Kane. Um, he had hoped to uh, leap up really high, this 15-foot wall, and then use the grab edge reaction and then climb up but he can't do that because he's laughing so well he's denied that way of getting to the caster so now he's going to go back and support his allies he has this 40 foot speed so that means that he can stride here as one action that's the purple the first stride and stride here as his second action <laughs> And with his last attack, he's going to flurry of blows. He's going to make two attacks against the Barbazu. So crane wing, crane wing. Um, that's a hit. And oh, this is a crit. So this is going to do 8 plus 20. 28 uh, damage reduced to 23 against the Barbazu. So um, that was a great turn. Uh, the GM gives him a hero point. <laughs> Duncan's now going to move right here. And try to finish off the Barbazu. He already has flanking from Kane, so he does not need to faint against it. So he's going to try to demoralize it right now, however, which will give it a um, minus one to all of its defenses and attacks. Says something um, intimidating and is going to roll intimidation against its will DC. 
And 18 is not enough, but that would be nice. He's doing that because he can do two attacks with this last action. And the third attack would have been less accurate. So here come the stumbling swings. Uh, that's a hit. 31. It would have been a crit if he had been frightened. Uh, that's a hit. Um, one hit, and that's going to do 13. That's going to be eight more damage to the Barbazu. Next is Helen, and she could try to hit the Barbazu, but I'm just going to show off something. She has basically um, a weapon that has the trip trait. Uh, the bow staff can be used itself uh, to trip foes. Normally you need to use a free hand to do this. And because it's a magical staff, plus one, uh, that gets added to any attempts to trip with it. So she's going to use her bow staff to try to trip it. And that succeeds, 24, and it falls to the ground. She's going to um, try to beat it up, do a flurry of blows against it on the ground. But she has the multiple attack penalty because she tripped first. And that's two misses. To be safe, she's going to now parry. That's another trait that the bow staff has. She can now try to defend herself, gives her a plus one circumstance bonus to uh, her AC. She takes two persistent damage and she still has this bleed effect. She's still bleeding. Next is the Caligny Slayer. It's going to move here and attack that little Leshy uh, with its uh, dagger, poisoned dagger. And that is a hit. It doesn't do a lot of damage, but uh, P's going to need to do a fortitude save against the Black Smear Poison. Oh, that's a miss. So she's going to be affected by 1d6 poison damage, and she's going to be enfeebled 1, which gives her the penalty to strength-based rolls. It then, with its third action, uh, steps north. The zombie Hulk is going to pick up another corpse and try to throw it at Harper. Oh, okay, nat 1. That misses. That's its turn. Now we are round four, and Harper is next, and she wants to finish off this Barbazu. She's going to move right here, and then do a flurry of blows with her bow. That's a miss. And miss. Um, well, so make one more shot. Now, not very lucky. Okay. Uh, the zombie Hulk is next. Oh, she takes bleed damage. One bleed damage and she continues to bleed. Okay, the zombie hulk is next, and it's gonna pick up another corpse and uh, throw it at Kane. And that misses. Next is P, and well, she's poisoned right now, uh, but it wasn't that bad. What she's gonna do is she's gonna uh, do a flurry of seeds against the Kalikni and hit and miss, and she's going to do uh, three uh, damage, not a whole lot. She probably should have done a melee attack uh, just now. But actually, because she didn't do that, she um, has enough actions to move right here and try to battle medicine Harper. Every one of her party members can benefit from her battle medicine once a day. Because she's an expert in medicine, she's going to try to do this tougher DC uh, to get 10 added to her healing. And, ooh, 17's not going to succeed. She's going to spend one of her hero points. She wants to get this uh, to happen. Um, 20 is enough. Good thing she had healer's gloves to give her a plus one item bonus to medicine checks. Okay, uh, but this is going to heal her. 22 health. That was nice. That was um, very important. P's turn ends, and she must save against the poison again. <laughs> she critically failed, and that was her one hero point. So she is now enfeebled. Well, she jumps down two stages uh, to stage three. She is now enfeebled two. Um, not good. And she also takes two damage. And the demonologist is next. Now he has two spells he's sustaining. He figures hideous laughter is not that important, uh, so he's going to not do that, and he's going to sustain the summon spell, so the Barbazu is going to stand up. However, um, Helen tripped it for a reason, um, to trigger the standstill reaction that she has. So with that bow staff she just tripped it with, she's now going to whack it. And <laughs> that hits it. Oh, 17 damage. She's been doing a lot of killing blows today. That's a dead Barbazu. And uh, the demonologist swears, and has two actions. So what he's going to do is cast another spell. He's going to cast Stinking Cloud, and Harper tries to recognize spell, and she automatically does, because it's a third level spell, and she's an expert in Arcana. They have to end their turn in its area. 
So it's going to stink up this whole area. Everything within it is going to be concealed. So there'll be a 20% miss chance against anything targeting someone in there. And also, those who are in it will have trouble targeting outside of it too. But also, if they end their turn in it, it's going to mean they are sickened one, and if they fail their save, they're also slowed one. I'll say right now, this was not a good choice of spell, and we will see why. All right, next is Kane, and he is going to do his leap again, 30 feet all the way over here. And he is now going to try to trip that zombie again. And, whoa, um, critically failing on a trip means he falls prone. Um, he's going to re-roll that with a hero point. Well, uh, fails, but at least not critically fails. And with this third action, he is going to move over here um, and hopefully pen the Caligny in. Duncan's next, and he's going to move right here. He's flanking the Caligny. With his next action, he's going to insult it. <laughs> but as it turns out, he doesn't share a language with it, and it has no effect. With his uh, next action, he's going to do a flurry of blows. Stumbling swing, uh, that's a hit, and that's a miss. So he's going to hit once, ooh, and do um, eight damage, and um, it has to save against um, the stunning fist, and it succeeds, so not stunned. Helen's next, and he she plans to head over here to the west, uh, hopefully providing some flanking from the left against the zombie Hulk. But she figures she can help against the Kaligni by um, glaring at it. She doesn't share a language with it, but this means she doesn't care. Otherwise, she'd have a minus four penalty. She's also physically intimidating it, so she gets a plus one bonus, circumstance bonus, to this attempt. She succeeds. Uh, it is frightened one. Then she's going to move here, right there. The last thing she does is she's going to parry with that bow staff. She also bleeds uh, and is going to try to recover. And she's still bleeding. Caligny is next, is going to try to stab Duncan with its other poisoned weapon, a Kukri. And that misses. Now, Duncan, um, it's not going to be flat footed to Duncan's next stumbling swing. We'll see if that plays out. Uh, but now it's going to try to run away. It can try to move through an enemy's space by using the tumble through action. It's going to do an acrobatics check and compare that against Kane's reflex DC. That succeeds. It treats uh, that as a difficult terrain, uh, Kane square, and it double strides all the way over here. And its uh, frightened value goes down. Now we go to round five, and Harper is now going to uh, try to get a good shot at the zombie. Well, kind of a good shot. And she's going to use her bow to try to do a flurry against it. And those are two hits. Oh, not much damage, however. Oh, that's better. She does 13 damage to it. And also, it does a fortitude save uh, because it's within 30 feet of Harper. It might get stunned. And it does not get stunned. Then with her offhand, she's going to try to use battle medicine on herself. She needs a 15, and she critically succeeds. So that's 4d8. Excellent job on herself. As you can see, the zombie Hulk is a lot of hit points, and it's going to be tough to take down. Well, it's going to move here, and without picking up a corpse, it can just try to hit Helen uh, with a big meaty fist, or literally a hunk of meat, according to the stat block. Now, she raised her bow staff to parry, so that literally reduced its crit chance by an entire one-third. We'll see what happens. 28 hits. It would have needed a 34 to crit. Ooh relatively uh, low damage for the zombie hulk. That's going to be 10 damage. Next is P, and she's going to move all the way here with two strides. Then uh, use battle medicine on Helen. She's also going to go for the more difficult uh, check to try to heal more. And that succeeds and heals 15. And she needs to save against poison again. So that's a critical success this time. She goes up to uh, stage one and is only enfeebled one. The demonologist is next, and he will delay... Kane is also a little bit wary, and he's going to also delay and see what's up. And Duncan is next. Uh, Duncan could go after the Caligny because it's flat-footed to him right now, uh, because it missed. But he has other ideas. He's going to go here, and he's going to enter a different stance. He's going to go into another fighting style. He's going to go into tiger stance. So he's not limited. As you can see, a monk is not limited to one fighting style over the course of a career. It uses one of his three actions. Now he can do regular fist strikes, but also tiger claw strikes, which do slashing damage. And each attack will trigger the weakness of this zombie hulk to slashing damage. 
Now, he could do two strikes at it. However, it would trigger the weakness of the zombie only once. So he's going to be using his level 4 feet, Flurry of Maneuvers, where he can mix grapples, shoves, and trips with his normal strikes. So now he has one action left. The first thing he will do is try to do um, a Tiger Claw. And that hits! Mm, 15 damage, and it has weakness 10 to slashing. So that's going to be 25 damage. So, big blow. The second thing he's going to do is to try to trip the zombie. Now, how is he able to trip something that's huge? It's two sizes larger than he is. Well, he also has the Titan Wrestler feet. He can basically do these things against huge creatures. And when he, when he becomes a legendary in athletics uh, against gargantuan creatures. And he's not going to do a roll for tripping. He's going to use his skill feat Assurance, uh, which in the case of athletics checks like this one, he doesn't have to do a roll, and it gives him a guaranteed result of 10 plus his proficiency bonus, which is 9, since right now he's level 5 and an expert. Anyway, there's a formula behind that. Note that the multiple attack penalty did not apply. So Assurance is a great way to uh, do a athletics maneuver uh, as one of your last attacks in the turn against foes that you think it's going to work against. And that's enough! Remember, we they had recalled knowledge and found out that it had a low reflex DC uh, that uh, causes it to fall crashing to the ground. So he deserves a hero point for that, definitely. The demonologist did not like that. Did not like that at all. He stalks around to uh, along this upper platform and is going to cast a spell against Duncan, which Harper recognizes as Acid Arrow. So out comes the Green Bolt. And that is a hit, despite the cover provided by the zombie. And he's going to take 3d8 damage. Acid damage. So, ooh, ouch, 15 acid damage. And he's going to take 1d6 persistent acid damage as well. Kane jumps back into initiative. He's a little concerned for Duncan right now. He wants to catch its attention, and he uh, Kane has a good defense, so he's gonna jump <laughs> forward. He's gonna raise his sturdy shield that he has, and he's gonna do a flurry against the zombie on the ground. So here come those crane wing attacks. Twenty-one. Okay, one of them hits. Oh well. <laughs> that was not good either. Six damage, minimum damage. But he has an amazing twenty-five AC right now. It doesn't stack with his crane stance, by the way. They are both circumstance bonuses. Next is Helen, and remember that feat I did not disclose during part one? Well, she at level two took the shooting star stance. She's going to enter the stance now. And this lets her throw shuriken, which are a monk weapon, and shuriken don't require any action to reload. So she could just throw it. And she has a magical shuriken that is a uh, plus one striking returning Shuriken. Every time she strikes with it, it returns to her hand. So pretty cool. She's going to attack with it, and she wants to get out of this thing's reach. So she is going to move up these stairs right here. The Shuriken have a range increment of 20 feet, so no penalty. No range penalty. This allows her to attack it from a safe distance. And that is a critical hit. <laughs> um, she's been getting crits today. Um, that's 18 damage from a Shuriken. Um, and it returns to her hand, and then she throws it again and hits it. And that is going to be 17 more damage. And notice that it hit because it was flat-footed uh, and tripped by Duncan. Next is the Caligny Slayer, and these are Lurker types, and it wants to get its advantage of uh, surprise again. So it's going to cast a spell, uh, Darkness, which it can do at will. It is going to create a uh, dark area that it can see through. And darkness, the way it works in Pathfinder, is that anyone who has dark vision can see through it, uh, even the magical darkness spell. So for most of the party members, this is going to be a problem. Not for Helen, however. And darkness costs all three of its actions. So now we enter round six. Next is Harper. It knows what square the zombie's in, so it's going to try to attack the zombie. Uh, because she cannot see in the darkness, she's going to have to... Uh, do a flat check with every attack roll. So she will need to get an 11 or higher on both of these uh, bow attacks she's about to make from her flurry. Looks like the second attack might hit. So here we go. And ooh, that is a critical hit at the nat 20. Those do crits uh, still <laughs> in Pathfinder. And bows have the deadly trait. In addition to the normal doubling of damage, you add a d10. So that's going to be 30 damage. 
Because she took Elven Weapon Elegance as her ancestry feat, it is also immobilized. It has an arrow sticking it to uh, the ground, and it needs to spend an action, you can call it a waste an action, in order to do any move actions, including standing up. Oh, and also it has to make a save against uh, the Stunning Fist ability. That is a failure. She had a DC of 21, so it is stunned one, Though, actually, that doesn't stack with slowed, so it doesn't really have an effect. If she had stunted three, however, it would have. Well, it's next in initiative, so she really wants to take it out. So she's going to try to um, fire again, but it's in the darkness, so she's going to have to uh, do these flat checks. Okay, one more possible hit, plus four, and that misses. Next is the zombie Hulk. <laughs> it um, tries to stand, and... Ah, it sees it's kind of stuck, so it's going to spend an action, uh, needs a 10 on this to uh, pull out the arrow. Um, and while it's prone, it's going to do its ability. Wide swing! It can hit two creatures within its reach. I remember it has reach 15 feet. And it does a single attack roll and compares it against both targets. So let's see what happens. Plus, plus 13 because it's prone. 22. That fortunately misses both of them. If it had stood up <laughs> and not been prone, it would have hit um, Duncan. All right, so P is going to um, try to use the low cover provided by the stairwell here um, to try to hide against the zombie Hulk. Even though she can't see the zombie Hulk, she can still try to hide against it. And we add two to the result because of the cover. And she succeeds. So it is flat-footed to her. She still has to target it successfully. So instead of advantage and disadvantage canceling each other out, her being unable to see inside and her hiding successfully both take effect. So she is going to now do a flurry of seeds against the zombie Hulk. Oh, and both miss because of the darkness. With the last action, she's going to spend her last key point and cast Wholeness of Body one point all these focus spells cost one point and she's going to heal herself 16 but it also attempts to counteract the poison that's affecting her right now um her counteract rank is three because she's fifth level and this poison has rank one so she has to not critically fail on this counteract check and she succeeds no problem so the poison's gone and she uh, doesn't have to worry about it at the end of her turn now we have Duncan, who cannot see the zombie right next to it. So um, he's going to have trouble uh, targeting it. Um, he's going to flurry. No, he's not going to flurry, actually. And we're going to see why. His first attempt um, might possibly hit. And here comes his attack. He's going to use his Tiger Claw. And it hits with a nat 4. Now he's going to make his second attack. And the reason he didn't flurry before was because both attacks that they had hit would have combined their damage before applying weakness. He wants to preserve a better attack penalty for this next action of his. So he's going to have to try to target it again. Does not succeed, and he has that hero point. He's going to spend a hero point. You can spend on, a, on, on any d20 roll, and succeed. So now he's going to try to, to, to target it, and that's uh, <laughs> that's an at 20. <laughs> uh, that's a crit, and this is the amount of ridiculous damage he's doing now. Um, 30 plus the weakness, so 40 damage um, is done. <laughs> to the zombie. And it's destroyed. It's now just itself a hunk of meat. He is now going to move towards that uh, Kaligni, um, try to threaten it, and also kind of move towards the caster. While in the darkness, every square is difficult terrain. Um, moving upstairs is difficult terrain. Those both do not stack. He moves right here. He takes the persistent acid damage, and it, uh, it ends. So he's no longer um, burning from acid. The Demonologist sees that they're now getting closer, so he's going to uh, do something defensive. He's going to cast Blur on himself. That uh, means that any attempt to target him is going to have to roll a 5 or higher on a flat check. Now, Kane wants to get to that Spellcaster. Um, so he's going to do a Leap of Faith <laughs> and try to leap um, right here. Um, and he sees that he's out of the darkness, and he has his own key spell, Key Rush. And with this, as a single action, he gets destroyed two times. 5, 10. Uh, that's going to be 40 feet total. Go all the way here. He can go a total of 80 feet. Gets right in the demonologist's face. And he also becomes concealed himself until the start of his next turn. 
And with his last action, he's going to do a flurry of blows against this uh, caster. So he has his own targeting checks and needs five or higher on both. Uh, he succeeds, and so he has two possible hits. Okay, one hit, 11 damage. All right, Helen's going to stride all the way up here. She can reach the demonologist with a bow staff. That took two strides, and with the last action, uh, because she had released her grip um, in order to throw Shuriken, uh, she needs to restore her grip as an action to get that um, extra threat with her bow staff back again. So she does that. She uh, bleeds for four damage and uh, still bleeds. Next is the Caligny Slayer, who um, is going to go for Duncan, who is flat-footed because he can't see the Slayer. And it's going to try to stab him with that poison. 24 is a hit, 13 damage, and he has to save against the poison and succeeds. Um, he's going to try to strike again and misses. And the Slayer is going to try to sneak somewhere uh, to try to lose its foes. So it does a secret skill check and succeeds, and it's going to go right here. So it is now undetected to uh, the enemy, and they don't know what square it's in. Next is Harper, who um, actually knows what square it's in, because she is a werewolf, and she has the scent ability. She can smell as an imprecise scent 30 feet around herself. So that means that the Slayer, she can smell it, she knows what square it's in, and it remains hidden to her. She's going to still have to target it, but she knows exactly where it is. She's going to move up here and do a flurry right on that spot. So here are her two targeting checks, and they both possibly succeed. Two hits. Eight plus seven damage. That's 15 damage. She's beyond 30 feet from it, so she it does not have to save against Stunning Fist. Now it is P's turn. She's going to stride, two strides, right here, and um, do a seed pod flurry against uh, the demonologist. He's blurry, however, so she has to target him, and the first one's not gonna have a chance. And the second attack is gonna be a single hit. Four damage. Next is Duncan. He's going to go up these stairs, and he's going to stride all the way here. He can do that as a single stride action. He is going to do a flurry of maneuvers on the demonologist. He's going to try to grapple the demonologist, because if he can do that, it's going to have a chance um, of disrupting spellcasting. So he himself has to try to get past this blur effect, and he might succeed. And here comes the athletics check. Ah, 32. So the demonologist is now grabbed. That means that it is flat-footed to everybody. And also, in order to do any manipulate action, and that includes most spells, it has to do a flat check and get a five or higher. He also is immobilized. So the second part of his flurry maneuvers is going to be a, a tiger claw. Yeah. Um, this caster, once you get into its face, it's not that hard to hit. So this is going to hit 12 slashing damage. And the Demonologist is going to do a Fortitude save because this might stun him. And that 18 is... Uh, it, it would fail against Duncan's Class DC of 21, but why does it say success, you might be asking? That's because uh, Stunning Fist has the Incapacitation trait. Any effect with Incapacitation, if targeted against a higher level foe, that foe gets to treat their degree of success as one better when uh, resisting it. So even though the demonologist failed, um, he treats it as a success. If he had critically failed, rolled a nat 1, it would be treated as a regular failure, and he would only be stunned 1. That would be the worst that could happen to him because he's higher level. This is one way that uh, bosses are harder to take down, harder to stun, and incapacitate in a fight. If Duncan were a level 7 monk, then the caster would be stunned right now. So with Duncan's last attempt, he is going to try to insult it. <laughs> and, and, oh, I can't think of anything creative, but he's going to do bon mot. Uh, 16 against the will DC is not going to succeed. And we now move to this caster's um, turn, and he's pissed. And crackling energy starts to emanate from his hands uh, toward the party. And he needs to do a five or higher on this check, and he succeeds. And 
out comes a fourth level lightning bolt. <laughs> um, that's going to target them. It actually would be more of a diagonal line, but I couldn't uh, aim it precisely. So it's going to do a lot of damage. 5d12. And that... Oh, that's 41 damage. All right, let's see how they um, how they fare. Okay, I'm just gonna save against it. Ooh, that's a success, that's good. Only 20 damage. Helen. Oh, that's gonna fail. And she's gonna want to do her hero point on this one. And that succeeds. <laughs> she's down to um, four hit points. And P. is gonna fail so she's gonna go down from 57 to 16 hit points that hurt um and the demonologist will now try to break out of this grapple so it does an unarmed uh attack bonus roll so plus 17 against duncan's athletics dc of 23. oh <laughs> the demonologist uh, critically succeeds so he breaks out of the grapple and he gets to stride five feet. However, <laughs> striding does not avoid Helen's <laughs> standstill reactions. So she has to target this blurry guy and that possibly hits. And here comes the swing. Oh, that's a miss. Next is Kane and he is no longer concealed and he wants to help Helen out. So he's gonna do battle medicine on her and ooh, critically succeed. Um, gives her 13 health uh, back. And the next thing he does, he's going to try to beat up that demonologist. So here's two targeting attempts. Oh, the second one will miss due to blur. And here's the first attack. Ah, uh, that is a hit. So that's going to damage the demonologist for 12 damage. And Kane's last action is to prepare to aid Duncan on his next grapple attempt. You can aid as a reaction, but you have to set it up with a action during your turn. So Kane's going to continue to do a crane wings. Um, we'll do an attack roll to help um, with that. Next, Helen's going to give the demonologist an intimidating glare. By rule, she has to target uh, the demonologist. That's a success. And um, here comes the <laughs> intimidation check. Ah, uh, that succeeds. Um, the demonologist is frightened, as he should be. The next thing uh, she does is now try to trip the demonologist using her bow staff. And here's a targeting attempt. And this might succeed. Needs to beat a 21. Oh, and not successful. She's going to do a flurry uh, with these last attacks. Probably not going to hit. So here come targeting rolls. That blur is kind of annoying. Swings. Uh, one of them hits. 15 damage. Ooh, okay. Almost. She bleeds for five damage. You're probably hearing my cat purring right now. The Kalikni Slayer is going to run up and try to help its boss. That took three actions, however. It only has a 25 foot speed, which is normal in this game. Not like a monk. Uh, Harper's next, but she wants to delay until after Duncan. Uh, P does the same. And here we have Duncan, who is now going to try to grab that demonologist. Here comes a targeting check. And that succeeds. And Kane is now going to use his reaction. He had prepared to aid Duncan with this attack roll. And he also has the human feet cooperative nature, which gives him a plus four circumstance bonus to this check. And <laughs> by the default rules, to aid somebody, you only need to get a 20. And that stays constant through the whole game. It's something that my house rule. <laughs> but, ooh, okay, that's a 35. And that critically succeeds. A critical success on aid gives a plus two bonus, circumstance bonus to the main check. So now we have a total of plus 15 uh, to try to grab this demonologist. That succeeds, 29. So he is now grabbed. And this was part of a flurry of maneuvers, I should have said. So the next thing he's going to do is try to um, bop him. Uh, possible hit. Here we go. That is a hit for 10 damage. 
and he's gonna try to um, finish off this guy um, with a couple of last blows. Here we go. Tiger Claw. Miss. Miss. Okay. Megan, here comes P, who's going to try to finish off the boss uh, with a flurry of fists. And these might hit. Here we go. Hit for 11 damage. That knocks out the demonologist. The the crowd is cheering. The party's now celebrating. And now they, they just have this lowly mook to go after. Um, the, P, the P is now going to do his second attack from his flurry against the Kaligmi. And that misses. So it makes another couple of attacks because she can. Miss. That's a hit. Uh, that's going to do eight more damage. Okay, Harper is next. She's going to finish this off. She um, has a 40-foot speed, and she can easily get here. 80 feet. And then do a flurry of bows. Uh, here we go. That's a crit, and it's the uh, a deadly weapon, so this is it. All right, that's a dead Caligny. They have defeated their foes. Um, yeah, that's it. Those are five level five mechs in action. We are now going to go to part three where we look at what they can look forward to in higher levels and do some analysis of why it is that or how it is exactly that um, Pathfinder makes monks more fun and strong. In the meantime, please like and subscribe. This video took a lot of work. Ring the bell if you want to get notified about part three. And also, you may want to check out some other combat demonstrations that I've done, including the five level one human fighters demonstration, uh, which will be linked to in the video description, but also at the end of this video, as well as other combat demonstrations I've done, including a level 20 fight. And if you haven't yet, uh, join my Discord where we talk Pathfinder 2E, other RPGs, and games and join my Patreon where you get to get access to videos one week in advance and get exclusive access to uh, the two campaigns I'm running for D&D YouTubers and other exclusive content. So that's it. I have been Ronald the Rules Lawyer and I'll see you next time.